the lecture on philosophy of classical indian theater and performance by professor dhananjay singh who is a professor in center for english studies jawaharlal nehru university i uh, welcome uh, all the participants and uh, i welcome professor dhananjay singh for accepting our invitation and being present this afternoon to speak on this subject uh, we know that uh, uh, today's subject is very important for us because a meaningful discussion on a subject like classical indian theater and performance uh, does not happen every other day i presume from our discussions that uh, he is going to uh, obviously uh, uh, start with uh, the great natya shastra of bharat muni which as we know was written uh, a couple of centuries before the beginning of the common era and which is the foundational text not only of uh, a drama that is natya but natya there includes uh, nritya and uh, of course sangeet as well so nritya sangeet and natya for all of them it is bharat muni's natya shastra which is in some sense uh, an encyclopedic text is the foundational uh, text for all these things uh, unlike uh, the poetics uh, written by uh, 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 written by aristotle in the uh, in the western tradition this is a very very uh, comprehensive text which talks about all aspects of uh, all aspects of drama music etc starting from the origins of these things to how they should be performed how actors should behave etc etc so it's an encyclopedia of the entire art in a way and of course the future uh, uh, sort of uh, contributors to uh, to the theory of uh, uh, to the theory of poetics and to the theory of dramatics in india great uh, people like uh, some of them i think uh, dhananjay is going to talk about uh, bharti hari then abhinav gopt and many others they obviously built upon the foundations thus created uh, by bharat muni more than 2000 years ago so uh, obviously and the main contribution of bharat muni apart from uh, all these things was uh, uh, was the uh, the great rasa theory uh, which he gave which explained uh, you know what is the uh, what is the emotional effect the overall effect of uh, of drama and of dance and music on uh, on on the minds of the of the audience and which of course Uh, the eight uh, rasas that he mentioned were then uh, you know added to uh, by uh, abhinav gupt later uh, he added the the ninth rasas a uh, ninth rasa uh, to the eight rasas which were uh, which were conceived by uh, uh, bharat muni so uh, and as we know uh, that uh, this ras theory is at the heart of the entire uh, indian understanding of uh, of uh, dramatics and of poetics so with these few words i would now like to welcome uh, dhananjay singh to proceed with his lecture thank you uh, thank you so much uh, uh, dr ravikant mishra ji for this um, opportunity uh, thank you um, tikbal and everybody here and everyone who has joined online uh, well this is a great privilege for me uh, to be speaking here uh, in the nehru memorial library and um, and speaking on a subject which is uh, which is dear to me Uh, which of course uh, has been uh, summarized in a way by dr mishra uh, and uh, so obviously yes as he mentioned from bharata's natya shastra to abhinav gupta's amida bharati there is a cumulative tradition of text and commentaries uh, well the idea of my talk today's talk is theater and performance and in the abstract that i submitted um, i argue that uh, that theater and not theater uh, and non theater performances in the sense that let's say the performance of song the performance of a dance uh, how these constitute an integral art form so in in that context i'm going to talk about theater uh, theater as performance and uh, my emphasis would be on the philo philosophical foundations of theater and performance in the classical indian tradition beginning bharata's natya shastra Uh, well, as Dr. Mishra, uh, you know, referred to in his introduction, so natya is a composite uh, term uh, in in theatre and uh, aesthetic tradition, um, and uh, natya and nritya and nritya and natan these are synonymous terms. These these are the these terms have common uh, etymological origin. 
uh, all these terms are based in uh, a semantic and a philosophical understanding of performance being a uh, key human behavior. Uh, and this has some relation to the way uh, classical Indians understood language and the relation of language to reality, uh, relation of language to human behavior. Now, all this I'll be touching upon, especially when I refer to Bhartrahari. But as I said, as I said, Natya or performance, so I'm, I'll use Natya and performance synonymously for the reason that uh, for the reason that Natya or theater uh, shares its vocabulary, uh, its instruments, its its uh, you know uh, its system uh, with other art forms, other performative forms. As I said, as I said, Natya shares its etymology with Nitya, uh, with Nritya, and with Natan. Uh, you know, Sri Harsha, Sri Harsha, twelfth century uh, CE. Um, who is a poet, obviously, a very celebrated poet in the classical tradition, uses the term Tore Trika, uses the, uses the term Tore Trika to refers to Natya. Tore, tore Trika, of course, which, which would involve dance, you know, which would involve dance as well as music, and therefore Tore Trika. Bharata himself, Bharata himself would call dance forms such as Tandava and Lasya, as synonym of Natya, and therefore it's a composite composite term. Now, when we look at the relationship of Natya with Nritya and Nritya, three kinds of understanding is possible. Uh, as I said, all three share the etymology Nritya. Nritya is a is the etymological word uh, term. From Nritya, three terms evolve. In if you look at Sanskrit etymology, from Nritya. Three terms involved, Nritya, Nritya, and Natya. Now, Nritya is any physical movement, any physical movement that is rhythmic, that is rhythmic. Sometimes we, we make movements, obviously, we, when we are under some emotional, uh, we, are, we are in an emotional mood. That physical movement that merely communicates a, a rhythm is Nritya. From Nritya, we come to Nritya. Nritya is a dance movement, let's say. Dance movement that communicates a, fr a, a phrase, for instance, uh, a, 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 meaning of, a, a, a meaning of a phrase, for instance, a group of words, for instance. Let's say a dancer moving her hand uh, and communicating a, move, uh, communicating a certain meaning from a certain flourish of hand would be Nritya. Now, from Nritya, we move to Natya. Now, it, com as compared to Nritya, which is focused on uh, a communication of a meaning of a group of words, let's say, or phrases, for instance, Natya involves a communication of a syntax, a communication of a dialogue. But at the same time, all three share techniques, for instance. That's why, that's why, and we'll talk of talk. We'll talk about the fundamental, let's say, uh, primitive, uh, you know, primitive desire in humans to perform. Where does it come from? Is it something in the classical Indian tradition, any term or category, for instance, theoretically uh, uh, speaking, any understanding that Indian philosophy gives that talks about this intrinsic human desire to perform. And uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm going to present is this, that it's an intrinsic human uh, you know, necessity to be performing all the time. We are performing all the time. And why do we perform all the time? That question is going to remain. That question will remain in my talk today. And I'll, 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 I'll have you know, examples from theater to, to kind of present uh, a certain point of view to the question. Uh, one, of course, is this, is are we performing all the time in our lived experiences as well as in theater? Uh, and why do we perform? Why do we perform? Is, uh, is, there, is, is there something in the Indian philosophy of language that gives us this idea of, uh, per, of uh, ubiquitous uh, you know, performativity that uh, all humans uh, are, uh, find themselves in? And I'll, I'll bring in Bhartarari there. But first of all, um, in order to explain why I use, uh, basically why I use uh, the word philosophy, uh, you know, for theater and performance, and in what sense I do do I use it? 
um, I would like to I like to I'd like to make a point at this point of time to say that well uh, there is a certain uh, philosophical foundations of theater and performance in India and uh, and this and this idea uh, comes from the comes from the evidence in the Natya Shastra where Bharat Muni uh, would uh, trace uh, theater and performance and its linked with the four Vedas with for the, with the four Vedas. Uh, well, uh, the idea is also based upon the fact that theater and universe, performance and reality, uh, theater and, and, and the empirical, the physical you know, world out there, uh, enter, is always into a symbiotic relationship. There is a relationship between theater and reality. Uh, between performance and the universe, uh, that idea actually emanates from the connection that Bhartamuni makes between uh, between Natya and the Veda. That's a point that I'm trying to make. Uh, why is it so? Because we all know that the Vedas, uh, in, in the context of the relationship between theater and reality, uh, the Vedas, of course, are representations of um, of reality. Uh, the Vedas, which are of course texts. Which are, of course, enumerations, uh, enunciations, and utterances. Linguistic utterances are, in fact, in fact, manifestations of reality. That's how it is understood. And uh, to quote, uh, uh, to quote a passage from, uh, you know, Shatpat Brahmana, uh, and I'm quoting Christopher Brisky here. Prajapati looked around over all existing things and beheld all existing things in a in the threefold lore, the Veda. I will construct for myself a body so as to contain the whole threefold lore. In this manner, he put this threefold lore into his own self and became the body of all existing beings. Uh, Prajapati, the primordial father, that's how he's understood in the Vedas, obviously. Uh, here in this speech, obviously, makes a connection between his body, uh, the world of nature, and the world of human mind. Now, this is what uh, this 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 connection is something that becomes apparent in theater. That's the argument that I'm trying to make. What it suggests, therefore, is a shared existence, shared shared existence of human body, mind, world, and language. Now, the creator, the creator uh, is the first artist, obviously, in that sense. Prajapati is the first artist. And he creates this universe. Now, in the classical Indian tradition, uh, you know, the universe is understood as a, as, as, as a continuously running performance with the emergence and disappearance of forms, sounds, costumes, emotions of men, you know, animals and birds. Therefore, it is not surprising that Brahma uh, in the classical Indian, uh, you know, tradition of aesthetics as well, uh, you know, uh, as is evident in the first chapter of the Natya Shastra, the Brahma is a, is a creator of both the universe as well as theater. He he draws the performed word, performed word from Rigveda, music from Samveda, performance or acting uh, or abhinaya from Yajurveda, and mental emotive states. Uh, or aesthetic consciousness, rasa, hava and rasa from other other Veda. What I'm trying to trying to say here is this: that therefore it's it, therefore uh, it is not without reason that we find that Brahma who creates the universe in the uh, who is the creator of the universe is also the creator of drama as as it as as it is evident in the first chapter of the Natya Shastra. Now Bharata makes a very important point there in that chapter where he says where he says that. Theater is a supreme art and knowledge form as it contains knowledge from all disciplines, all, all disciplines, apart from the knowledge of phenomena and empirical reality that we talked about. What, what I'm trying to say, trying to, uh, you know, uh, say here is this, that there is an intrinsic, real, intrinsic connection between theater and the universe and the universe. And the, and the knowledge about aspects of the universe, obviously, which are there in the different disciplines of knowledge as understood in the classical Indian tradition. An example that I would like to give here is, of course, the famous Nataraja uh, you know, image, of course, which is the dance of Shiva. Now, uh, Shiva in that Nataraja posture, Nataraja posture, oh, he symbolizes the universe, obviously. 
And therefore, it's the best example to talk about the relationship between performance and, uh, and the universe and the world as such. And uh, what Shiva does, of course, uh, through, through his dance is to, uh, is, to direct, is, to, is to direct or galvanate, for instance, uh, galvanate the whole cosmos through his physical, mental and musical movements. In, in fact, therefore, he turns the entire cosmos into a dance. So what we saw, what we see in the Nataraja uh, posture uh, uh, of Shiva is the dance of the universe. Uh, and what are the elements that dance in the universe that Shiva galvanizes into dance, of course, are the Parmanus or the subatoms or the energy principles. The arch around Shiva that we see in the Nataraja, in, the Nat Nataraja, in fact, uh, you know, is, is the universe itself. Now, Shiva holds uh, in the Nataraja figure you might, uh, you might have seen, Shiva holds a drum in his right hand, which suggests, suggests creation. And the drum produces vibrations of sounds. The upper la left hand, you know, is fire, of course, which stands for destruction. The lower left, left hand is pointing towards the left foot, which is raised and refers to the ultimate home of all liberated selves. There is a right leg that crushes the demon. The demon, the dwarf figure, of course, symbolizes ignorance. So what I'm trying to say here is that, that Shiva in the Nataraja space, uh, you know, it, of chitta or human consciousness in a way and therefore symbolizes this intrinsic relationship between the internal human world internal human world and the external human world that I'll talk about now how does Natya Shastra uh, you know uh, develop this idea that's the that is that is that is the uh, that that's a that's a second that, that's the next point that that I want to make here uh, well uh, in the in the first chapter itself, uh, there is a discussion about uh, space of theater. There's an interesting narrative, obviously. Uh, you know, well, I digress if I go into uh, into uh, into detail here because uh, the first instance of freedom of thought or freedom of art uh, in world literature, perhaps, is in the in the first chapter. In fact, uh, uh, where uh, there is an instance where the asuras they destroy a theater performance. Uh, and there's a conversation between the Asura leader, Virupaksh and Brahma, and they talk about art and art's special role and how, how freedom of art is a necessity, uh, necessary, and how art should not be confused, perhaps we can interpret today, um, uh, confused uh, you know, and dragged into uh, you know, political viabilities. Uh, that's the point that one may, uh, that Brahma makes there in that, in the, in that, um, in that, uh, in that chapter in the Nakhita chapter. What is important for me here, when I'm talking about theater space uh, in context of the dance of Shiva, that I'm borrowing the paradigm from this dance to theater, is this, that the theater space, that which Brahma, in fact, calls, uh, you know, um, um, to, be, to, be, to be created, uh, uh, he calls Vishwakarma, the, the divine architect, obviously, to create a theater architecture. Uh, and there is a there, there is a relationship that is established there between the forms of theater uh, and forms of reality and forms of space which makes uh, you know possible uh, this performance of certain reality. Therefore, for different kinds of plays in the Nartya Shastra, you have different kinds of theater houses because there is intrinsic real relationship between the space, human performativity, and social reality. That's a that's a kind of idea that we find here. But but what's more important for me uh, to 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 establish here is is this that what constitutes this theater space? Uh, if you if we if we go to Natya Shastra, read the chapter. Obviously, what is what is clear is this that uh, everything that constitutes the universe, the humans, the birds, the animals, uh, the gods. Uh, Brahma is right there, right there, the center of the stage. They're all gods, from wind gods, uh, you know, fire god, you know, all all gods, deities, dhanavas, demons, uh, all 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 beings, all beings, a uh, non uh, non non human beings as well. Trees, plants in the in form of the paintings, uh, you know. In, in other words, the entire cosmos, the entire cosmos, the entire universe. The entire universe is present in the theater house, not simply as an external element as such, but an element that cannot be distinguished at all from the performance that goes on on the stage. And after what is the performance that goes on stage? 
Uh, what is the meaning that gets communicated uh, you know, when a play is performed? Right? Because the meaning affects consciousness. If the meaning affects consciousness, then it's, a, it's a not, a, not a simple <coughs> verbal or physical communication taking place. There is a certain philosophical basis to explain this, which I'll come later on uh, you know, when I interpret the word dresser. When I, inter uh, when, I, when I interpret the word dresser. Uh, so in that, in that sense, it's, it's important for us to, uh, important for us to, uh, to consider uh, spaces uh, centrality there and uh, theater spaces relationship uh, with theater. Now, as multiple components, now there are eleven components of theater in Natya Shastra. Uh, Dr. Mishra, uh, you know, talked about Aristotle, Aristotle poetics. In Aristotle's poetics, uh, you know, Aristotle, though I mean, uh, you know, if you read poetics um, and if you read the beginning of the poetics, and obviously we know that Aristotle's poetics also. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there are uh, there are perhaps parts that are not not available. But if you read the beginning of poetics, uh, Aristotle does talk about abhinaya, does talk about physical movement. So it's difficult for me to, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, it, it makes us wonder then why for him is spectacle uh, of least importance of the six components of drama that is important for sec, uh, for uh, Aristotle. Uh, but nevertheless. Uh, when we when we come to the Indian performance, Indian theater, there are eleven components of theater, and all eleven components of theater are integral, of course, uh, where spectacle is of most importance. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as compared, uh, unlike Aristotle's poetics, why theater uh, uh, performance is most important because without performance, uh, the you know manifestation or realization or production or perception that is doubtful. Uh, or consciousness of rasa is impossible. That's why spectacle or abhinay is extremely important. I'll come come to that point with some elaboration later on. But at this point, uh, at this point, just to make a statement to integrate theater and space, the 11, 11, 11 components of theater or drama, of course, uh, dialogues, uh, bhava, that we'll discuss uh, the four kinds of abhinay, which is enactment. Uh, then the two modes of representation, folk and stylized, natya and loka, uh, four uh, styles or four forms of human behavior, vritti. Uh, then of course songs, uh, then uh, um, instrumental music, atudya, uh, and the space. And all, all these in fact integrate uh, to kind of, uh, to mature into rasa, the aesthetic experience, which is realized by the spectator, by the spectator or the prekshaka. So in, in other words, there are multiple forms, there are multiple forms, uh, multiple components of theater from text, from, from text to the stage. Uh, similarly, there are multiple forms of spaces in the theater house. And when the, when the play is being performed, there is a constant integration taking place. And the philosophical foundation of this, of this is, is, is the oneness of being, oneness of being that Indian philosophy is premised upon, that all apparent differences, all apparent dis differences resolve and terminate into a seamless integration of being. Now, that's what the theater space, as well as the theater uh, theater uh, performance, in fact, produce, uh, you know, by coming into uh, some sort of a syncretic unity. That's a, that's an idea that I'm trying to put forth. Now, uh, for theater to, uh, be, to, to be possible uh, in, the, in, 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 in the Indian system, uh, there's a lot of reflection upon emotion. And uh, and obviously we well, we all know uh, in obviously literary performance studies that again coming from the uh, Greek source and there is a distinction between emotion and thought. Uh, Plato's famous indictment of writers, you know, in Republic Ten is is on the basis that uh, that writing, literature, or poetry, in fact, represents emotion. That's the weaker part of the human self uh, or soul. He calls it soul. Of course, we call it self. Uh, and uh, but in India, in India, uh, in the classical Indian tradition, uh, there is no distinction whatsoever between emotion and thought. Emotion and thought. Uh, and uh, when we, uh, when I say that uh, now uh, at this stage of my talk, when I say that performance is a representation of bhava, what I mean, of course, is not merely emotion. Not merely emotion. 
but an entity uh, you know that's an integration of emotion and uh, emotion feeling and, and thought obviously uh, the the meaning of etymological meaning of bhava of course come from who uh, which of course stands for being uh, as well as for becoming that's the point uh, that that i'm trying to trying to make and uh, here um, here uh, when i move ahead uh, uh, when I move ahead to move ahead, I just make another point. Of course, is this that uh, that all of us know? Obviously, that it, that as far as the classical Indian thought uh, on performance in theatre is concerned, it's a representation of uh, emotions, uh, uh, emotions slash thought, let's say, or powers. Unlike the Western system, uh, where Aristotle, of course, defines tragedy as an imitation of action. Uh, and there's a dialogue again in Natya Shastra, you know, first chapter. Uh, you know, bhava anukirtana, that's what Natya is, that's what Brahma tells Virupaksha, that it's a bhava anukirtana, performance of bhavas, obviously. And there are 50 bhavas in Natya Shastra, including the contribution of Nirveda by Abhinav Gupta. Nirveda used to be, Nirveda is the, the, can be translated as indifference or detachment. Uh, in Nirveda was, in fact, pointed out as an emotional state, emotive, you know, uh, cognitive, uh, you know, state by Bharata uh, as a Thai Bhava of, uh, sorry, uh, as a Sanjari Bhava or Vibhava of Jugupsa. But of course, uh, Abhinav Gupta raises it to the level of Thai Bhava. We, we can take, we can discuss it in, uh, you know, there are questions, obviously, all these terms. It's difficult to, you know, to kind of, kind of uh, in expand on all these terms right now, uh, you know, that will break the line of my argument. The point I'm trying to make over here is this, that uh, at this point of time, when I when I when I bring uh, uh, this statement from Bharat that uh, that theater or performance is a representation of uh, you know uh, is a power in the Anukirtana, I'm trying to use uh, you know Sankhya philosophy, which of course Bhattanayaka also uses in a different context, uh, to make a point to make a point uh, that uh, how uh, the objects of uh, objects of performance in theater uh, you know um, are in fact uh, abstracts abstracts of empirical reality, the reality that exists outside in forms of objects of nature, in forms of other human beings, obviously, uh, you know, in terms of birds, animals, and all that become the, con uh, all that serve as context of theater and the mental movements and the, and the mental movements, because in, in Indian philosophy, in Indian philosophy, uh, you know, there is a, there's a very intrinsic relationship, uh, this distinction of mind and matter, mind and matter, uh, for lack of a proper, you know, tra you know translated term, mind boring, mind and matter, exactly from Descartes, uh, the distinction of mind and matter does not uh, exist, uh, you know, in, in Indian philosophy, in Sankhya, obviously, uh, even in other philosophies, mind is, in fact, aspect of the body, as you know, especially in, with the Buddhist. Well, the point that I'm trying to make here, make here is this, that there is an intrinsic relationship between mind and matter, both mind and matter. The world that exists outside are constituted similarly, similarly, uh, and uh, uh, this can this becomes evident, uh, you know, uh, in the theory of gunas that we find uh, in Sankhya, which was first developed by a philosopher named uh, by the name of Kapila. Uh, he develops this idea of um, of uh, of guna, uh, which of course, uh, which of course, as I said, as I said, uh, understands uh, the world of matter as prakriti. But Prakriti and Purusha, Purusha as pure consciousness, and Prakriti is an ever-evolving matter, uh, ever-evolving and dissolving matter. And Prakriti, Prakriti, of course, which constitutes all objects of the universe, is constituted by, by three gunas, three gunas, three gunas in, in, in different forms. Uh, since they, these three gunas are, they're dynamic, but their relationship, their dynamic, their dynamism uh, is, is, is uh, you know, um, the, the dynamism is in different form, therefore different objects are produced uh, infinitely, perhaps different forms, they're, they're, therefore there are infinite objects. And, uh, and, and uh, what we generally understand as mind in the, uh, in the Western cons, uh, in the tradition, of course, is a part of the Prakriti, is a part of Prakriti, of course, is a part of matter as such. So when, I, when we talk of Sankhya, that's a paradigm that I'm borrowing that you know, uh, that is what is uh, most of the later philosophy would borrow from Sankhya. What I'm trying to say here is this, that, that what we understand as self, which is pure consciousness, which is rasa, which is rasa, which is rasa, which is pure consciousness. Uh, it is 
it is separate from matter it is separate from matter uh, and uh, it's pure knowledge uh, is it possible therefore is it, is it possible to realize that pure consciousness which is separate from matter because the human body the human mind the human senses the human ego the human intellect is also a part of matter is also a part of matter in fact human intellect buddhi human ego ahankara human mind mana in fact are the first evolutes of matter are the first evolutes of matter they are less grosser they are less grosser because they are constituted by what is called sattva sattva is more dominant in them in constituted intellect in constituted ego in constituting mind so they are subtle they are subtler than the gross matter like the glass that i am i am holding right now but nevertheless intellect ego and mind are also aspects of matter so if there are aspects of matter and consciousness is pure and all of us have chit of course chit then uh, how is it how is it how is it how is, uh, how is the realization of chit possible the philosophy of theater and performance says that in theater uh, in mu in music let's say uh, in mysticism uh, it is possible it is possible to evoke that consciousness that i'm talking about evoke that consciousness that i'm talking about uh, and that's where uh, the theory of bhava becomes important as i said bhava comes uh, from the etymology uh, etymological you know to who which means being obviously which also means pervade pervade so as it pervades our being that's what it is and uh, and 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 this the, the bhava uh, which of course has you know major categories of sthayi bhava vibhichari bhava uh, satvik bhava obviously uh, you know all and all uh, in all there are 50 bhavas uh, broadly i mean in very in, in, in short way if i if i if i have to Uh, explain the differences which many of you might be knowing of the states uh, sthayi bhava of course uh, is, uh, is 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 a, is a permanent you know durable innate innate psychological state innate psychological state in all of us obviously and it's durable is durable uh, there are 33 transitory states there are 33 transitory states vibhichari bhava sanchari bhava like anxiety and otsukya anxiety for instance Uh, you know uh, these 33 of course arise out of one's own life experiences one's own life experiences so one's own life experiences the empirical experiences and therefore in the very distinction between sai bhava and vibhichari bhava we are talking of an integration of something which is innately psychological innately mental uh, with something which actually evolves out of a emotive uh, or thoughtful experience of the world that exists outside and which is existent in my mind in form of memory in form of memory and then you have satvik bhava which are eight which are the most difficult to enact which is the most difficult to enact because they're involuntary they're involuntary they're involuntary now it may happen that you know well, well i'm watching a performance on stage let's say or i'm performing and there are 50 people in the audience all 50 will have different experiences there some people say generally we we find this questions in the classes where the students would ask that obviously the same play how can everybody respond similarly you know some people will have a different experience and, the, and it's, it's quite obvious and what makes it obvious is this that while the sthayi bhava the durable psychological state is permanent is permanent the vibhichari bhavas come from experience and since everybody will have different experience therefore people will differ Uh, either in matter of degree or in matter of time to respond to this that's the point that i'm trying to make over here satvik bhava the third category is most difficult because involuntary it's almost you know uh, you know uh, and not many uh, actors can produce it uh, because in satvik bhava you have to produce a meaning without a movement any movement on the face is it possible to and of course i i know when i'm saying this i'm now coming to abhinay of course which is this that all the powers have to be enacted uh, an actor is a great actor uh, on the basis of uh, how originally uh, he can study the different possible signs that a particular dialogue um, has potential to produce so actor actually a great actor not simply reads the dialogue basically a great actor imagine imaginatively creates what possible physical uh, gesture 
uh, the signs that a particular statement uh, has a potential to produce and he or she masters it. The most difficult to master, of course, is Sattvic Bhava, as I said, uh, and therefore Sattvic Abhinay is something only an accomplished actor can achieve because in Sattvic Abhinay you have to communicate through your face without actually moving the face, without actually letting any gesture form on the stage, on, on, on the face. Uh, you know, without you know, it, is it possible for somebody to you know, to have the face uh, not uh, you know outwardly? I mean, in terms of uh, you know the way you see it, uh, just uh, without any movement, and yet a meaning can be communicated. Uh, that uh, 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 that will require a, a great training, perhaps, or maybe an inborn inborn genius to do. You know, uh, I, I I will I will like to conclude. Uh, you know, by bringing in bringing in the category of vritti here uh, from uh, the theater tradition and linking vritti with abhinay and rasa and that's how i'll, uh, I'll conclude ultimately uh, when uh, abhinay gupta's of course uh, in a conclusion is this that in theater as i said is it possible to uh, to actually realize consciousness in theater abhinay gupta said wow. that yes theater uh, that's what rasa is there uh, theater invokes tasting of the human mind of course a mana uh, or chit or chit chat is it possible to do that uh, is it possible to feel uh, fear uh, and of course this relates to another question which is this that why is it that fear or karuna sorrow pathos fear vibhatsa disgust these are all negative seems to be negative emotions and states of consciousness why do we find it pleasurable uh, and of course, um, the, the the understanding is this because since they, they, these are so innate part part of our consciousness, therefore anything which is innate, uh, we will but enjoy uh, or, or, or or like or love its its manifestation. Uh, coming back to that connection between vritti, as I said, which is human behavior, of course, which in the Natyashastra tradition, uh, which uh, refers to this intrinsic human desire to communicate. And uh, and desire to communicate through uh, through body, through mind, through speech, uh, through and uh, this desire to communicate is a primitive, obviously, and uh, and the theater theater takes especially Natya Shastra lends itself to an interpretation, obviously, that um, that uh, uh, to think how this this primitive you know, desire to communicate actually uh, you know results into these four types. Which can be, uh, you know, which can be associated with four types of abhinay, and how in the in the in the realization of rasa as such, uh, the four types of abhinay and the four types of vritti uh, play a very very important role. By vritti, of course, I mean this. I mean human behavior, intrinsic human behavior, uh, the the primitive desire to communicate in four manners. Obviously, that's what it is, and that that is ultimately uh, that is ultimately. Uh, the objective of theatre. That's what it is. So I would like to end here. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, very much, Dhananjay, for this uh, very uh, enlightening and interesting talk on uh, a difficult subject. Difficult, but very, very relevant, very, very important for all of us. Uh, we are now open to uh, questions and comments from all the participants. Please raise your hand or ask the question straight away. <clears throat> well, I think it's taking a bit of time, there may be some technical snag. So uh, before opening it uh, uh, to everybody, let me, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, a few curiosities of my own regarding uh, the subject. And uh, since you are actually a, a professor of 
I professor of English literature, yeah, if yeah. I know <laughs> correctly. Oh, yeah. So you are best qualified to engage with this question. Mm. Uh, as I see it, mm. there is a fundamental difference mm. between the tradition of uh, what we call uh, Natya mm. in India and of course what is generally described as uh, poetics or dramatics uh, in the Western tradition is starting uh, with the Greeks. Uh, as uh, we referred earlier uh, uh, to the original, the most important and the earliest work by Aristotle on poetics, uh, which obviously refers to, uh, to both. Uh, the fundamental difference, as I see, uh, seems to be one that uh, we find that uh, the Greek tragedy, you know, uh, it was based on a, on, a, on a slightly different conception of life and the final questions, the ontological things which are, uh, you know, talked about and discussed about human life. Mm -hmm. So you see that uh, starting with Oedipus, for example, we see a certain uh, kind of uh, conception of drama whose objective is also very different from uh, from the objectives that Bharat Muni's Natyashastra talks about or that later writers talk about you. Talk, you know, Bharat Muni, for example, says that, you know, it is human emotions, you know, that are there and for every human emotion there is, there is a rus, there is a corresponding rus. And obviously the purpose is to become one with it. Then it is then that you, it's, it's in a way enjoyment, but enjoyment of a higher kind, maybe if we can describe it as a, as a spiritual kind of uh, thing. So art in that sense has been seen as a spiritual, uh, you know, as a spiritual kind of thing in, in the Indian uh, uh, tradition rightly so now so the curiosity that arises in me is what do you think is the reason behind this fundamental difference in the conception of drama especially of tragedy because you see there uh, in, in in the in the greek conception the idea is that there is that great man thesis you know there is a great man who is larger than life in every sense but he has one uh, fatal sort of flaw Mm -hmm. which if I remember correctly, they, they described as uh, Hamartia. Martia. Yeah, uh, it's pronounced variously mm -hmm. as Hamartia and Hamartia. Uh, so, uh, and because of which, you know, the fall of the hero, the fall of the protagonist happens. And probably the most uh, obvious example of this Hamartia is, uh, uh, is the example of Achilles, you know, who had everything, uh, you know, going for him and who was invincible, but for his heel. So that uh, classic example uh, uh, aside, uh, when we see that, uh, you know, in the case of uh, the Greek tragedy, it is fate that ultimately overcomes the hero and uh, defeats him. But on the other hand, in the Indian tradition, uh, we do have, of course, uh, we do have tragedies and tragedies are discussed in, uh, in our uh, uh, poetics. Uh, and of course, there are various uh, plays written by various, uh, 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 various people in ancient India. But why do you think, you know, this difference is found that we do not have, you may think that the question is coming from a Eurocentric perspective, of course, mm -hmm. but still I'm curious about it because you see there is a fundamental difference between our conception of tragedy in, 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 in drama and, uh, you know, the Western conception. So what do you think is the reason behind it or many reasons if you think so? Well, that takes us to a different uh, territory altogether. Uh, you know, uh, I'll just first of all respond to this whole uh, question of um, theatre, uh, you know, theatre thought and theatre theater aesthetic, especially vis vis emotion and uh, bhava. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, the early 20th century developments uh, and, and, and till mid century, uh, 20th century developments in theatre, theatre philosophy uh, uh, and theatre theory. Uh, people like you know Anatoly Akso in, in France, Theatre of Cruelty, uh, you know, uh, and uh, Maurice Maeterlinck, uh, the Belgian, uh, you know, uh, playwright and thinker. The kind of uh, you know departures that uh, actually, or, or radical changes that we saw in uh, that we see in 20th century theatre, vis-a-vis performance becoming very important, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the internal, you know, the emotional. Uh, and 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 human consciousness actually taking a very important role. Uh, the stage becomes independent. So the, the, there are, there are there are in fact very major changes 
in 20th century um, you know western theater that we might if find you don't mind but yeah 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 if you don't mind yeah. a very slight uh, you know interruption yeah. here you say that it's in the 20th century mm. that the you know the performance the stage became uh. independent but if you look at it historically speaking yeah, all the, the drama obviously is meant to be played and not meant to be read and uh. this was always so for example you know if you take the case of the plays of Shakespeare, no. because a very large number of people, in any case, used to be illiterate, and so they did not no, have but access see, to a textual you know, tradition. What I'm trying to say here is, is uh, drama as an integrated form. Drama as a form, uh, as a composite form. Tori Trika, the term that I used. Uh, well, Shakespeare was performed, but Shakespeare, the way Shakespeare is performed today, is not the way it was performed in 16th century, Obviously. where the dramatic text. Uh, what the changes that came in uh, 20th century with Akto and others was this that the text was no longer uh, the sole dominant uh, you know uh, entity the text written by the writer it changed on stage and it changed on stage you're talking stage, about the adaptation yeah, and not adaptation changes. not adaptation at all I'm talking performance I'm talking performance the problem that the problem that in 20th century people like theater would say that's why you call, call theater of cruelty which is that he says that lang theater has its own language theater is not the language of prose that or, or is that is written and what is the language of theater and where the body is important i mean in the dramatic text the performer's body and performance movement are not there in the dramatic text mm -hmm. dramatic text is potential text dramatic text the text of which is there in written, uh, written word text is only a potential text it's 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 in fact it, the real text actually manifest on the stage when there's music right when there's body movement when there's there is attempt to unravel the unconscious mm -hmm. the moods now all that that kind of consciousness that, that comes to western theater especially in the first half of the 20th century the plays that later on get written by people like I mean, what I'm trying to say is this that a movement from a realist tradition to a symbolist tradition is something gives us a, a comparative scope with Indian idea of theater. Mm -hmm. With the Indian idea of theater, obviously, that we never believed in the sanctity of one text. There were virgins, as you know. We have Uru Bhanga on Mahabharata. That's a performance. It changes completely the meaning of Mahabharata. So that kind of independence that's a freedom which the actor mm. which the actor will have which is the stage will have with a performative group will have that is something so basically in the 20th century the western theater thinkers are thinking of liberating the liberating performance from the dominance of the written text that's where there is a line of comparison because you asked about that yeah now coming to greek and, and, uh, yeah 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 you go ahead yeah. I'll, I'll coming to greek that. theater well you know i'm not especially the classical western you know drama and all that but yes I'll our world view you for a comparison yeah, <laughs> our world view which they're great these are great tragedies these are, these are, these are the philosophical you know basis for for fate for action obviously Oedipus is a big example as you know you, you mentioned Achilles and uh, but in India the epics have obviously there are tragic uh, you know you you you, you Mahakavya that Kalidasa writes based on Ramayana they're full of uh, the separation of Rama Sita they're full of uh, uh, full of uh, Karun Rasa and all but then not in the sense that Hamartia or Hamatia uh, it's not uh, not that why because the worldview is different yeah. because why because see the, uh, that's my understanding if I'm thinking uh, but why know, is the worldview different that's what I'm because we curious believe, about. because there is a belief in the cycle of things to change think that that mm -hmm. sense of there is no linearity that we've reached to a point where it's all dead end mm -hmm. there's a cycle of course the cyclicity of uh, that the fundamental philosophical paradigm of actually continually moving so therefore, even if one is in a, when one perhaps in, is you know is at a tragic point, there's always a possibility to come back. There's no notion of self, soul as such that we again come back. The sense of coming back, obviously, is it that's really a, because of that's that? What, that's what I think. I don't know. There's nothing. Or is it that you are speculating? Obviously, no, no, because no, we no, have speculate. to speculate. Yeah, yeah. Because, because there is no definite answer to no, this. I just wanted to huh, get your thoughts. See, on because this. there's nothing real as such that can be established. Obviously, but yes. There is a way to, you see, you, you, for instance, uh, there was a uh, uh, movie Ra Rajesh Khanna and Sharmila Tagore, where, you know, if you remember then, uh, I think it was Rajesh Khanna, the young Rajesh Khanna dies, 
the movie movie was movie was a flop they had to remake the movie mm. and show him alive again in a different that world. happened See, that happened to, to another movie no, the point Raj Kapoor's A ah, for example yeah, yeah. so what i said that he had to remake uh, mm. in the original ending the, the protagonist dies uh, and Raj Kapoor it is said he uh, he sat you know when the movie was being shown to the public in a mm. hall he sat uh, you know in the back seats and from the reactions of people he realized that the ending is not right so he changed the, the ending and then uh, in the new ending the hero lives on despite uh, suffering from tuberculosis mm. so you are quite right of course there are examples of this happening yeah, yeah. So this is this whole world view obviously he does not accept it and, uh, and that's that's the reason because obviously in, in we, we talk of natak and all and kalidas and uh, you know bhas i talked about and all but we don't have a tragic tradition obviously it's tradition of tragedies and the rich tragedies in Greek, obviously so this Euripides is and all very powerful place and, and a different culture altogether uh, but obviously it's the, it's the cultural values that produce the kind of literature or literary forms and genres that one writes and the worldview does certainly has to has to do with this and uh, even though I mean yeah yeah it's also because the purpose of drama and the purpose of art is probably conceived as uh, as as very different in in the western and the indian tradition mm. so and that of course you get a clue when you talk about the bhavas and and the rasas you get mm. a clue to what uh, mm. the objective of uh, poetics or of dramatics is in the indian tradition because in the classical greek tradition the focus was on producing catharsis mm. when you talk about tragedies and that obviously continues in in, in shakespeare's tragedies and another very interesting thing that you can see which mm. continues in uh, Shakespeare and tragedy in a big way is the idea of fate mm. uh, in, in some cases of course the idea of fate uh, appears uh, in an explicit manner for example I think you can take the case of uh, Othello mm -hmm. which is one of the, the great tragedies yes. of Shakespeare yes. and if you recall that it, it, I think this is in uh, in the last act I don't remember the scene now when mm. Othello is being arrested you know mm -hmm. he has killed Desdemona and he is being arrested mm -hmm. and if you recall that uh, very famous dialogue and he, he suddenly finds a weapon and he says I have seen the day mm -hmm. when this with, with this little arm and this good sword of mine mm -hmm. I have made my way yeah. through 20 times your impediment but oh vain boast who can control his fate mm -hmm. it is not so now mm -hmm. and then of course he kills himself mm -hmm. so that idea of fate of course is there as very very powerful mm -hmm. but i would say that even in the western tradition you see uh, you know there is a kind of movement for example if you see some of the uh, you know the, the novelists of the 19th century mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. how do you see that evolving because i see that in the novelists mm -hmm. the same uh, tradition of uh, of the dark kind of tragedy does mm -hmm. not continue of course you get traces of it in thomas hardy mm -hmm. but uh, generally you see that there is a departure do you think there is something inherent in novel as a genre that it did departure in what sense i mean from that classical notion of tragedy or do you the think tragedy, tragedy is meant yeah, only I mean, for drama is all uh, that we have left almost 20 years ago <laughs> and old. but yes certainly in uh, so say there is of course in hardy fates plays a major major role. exactly that's why i talked about hardy. In, uh, jude dobskir for instance you can face the uh, yeah in jude dobskir but this is all you know uh, 20 25 years ago that uh, that that we used to have uh, read all these things but hardy is very important also because we are thinking uh, of all these literatures actually uh, you know as representation of um, 19th century 19th century the rise of enlightenment and when Hardy and people like Hardy and Dickens are actually responding to them, when you have fate playing such an important role. Uh, ah, yeah, know? but Dickens is so, so different from so Hardy. Yeah. Obviously, all of them are different. Yeah. George Eliot, Dickens, both from these, they're all very different. Jane Austen, all different kinds of writer. But that's, it, that's actually a completely different terrain that we're going. But what I'm trying to say is certainly in, in, uh, in not only uh, in Hardy, in Hardy's pure fate, but in Dickens also chance is 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 a very important factor, very important factor. They, you know, your hard times and great expectations. So, but then we are in a different realm altogether. Uh, you know, going to nineteenth century fiction, but there. But there do are, you but, think that in the modern period, in the twentieth century, mm -hmm. you know, there have been sort of uh, uh, fundamental departures mm -hmm. in the the Indian theory of uh, poetics when it comes to uh, not so much uh, Sanskrit drama as I would say. 
but say drama in other Indian languages, say mm -hmm. Hindi. For mm -hmm. example, you take the plays of Jaishankar Prasad. Mm -hmm. uh, Jaishankar Prasad has written those famous plays on, uh, on Chandragopt, Iskandagopt, etc. Mm -hmm. And these are long plays. And I remember that uh, many critics said at that time that you know these plays do not lend themselves to easy performance mm -hmm. because one they are too long and they have not been written you know with uh, the the explicit objective of being played and Jayashankar Prasad then wrote a long article and he responded and he said that look uh, I mean the, the art of dramatics and the performing art itself has to evolve to have a different notion uh, of uh, of that art mm -hmm. so uh, do you think that in the Indian uh, other Indian uh, sort of uh, languages there I'm has been aware of other Indian languages of you are not. Name, but, but the point is, is that uh, the major uh, concepts that uh, that are there in theater of Rasa and Bhava and all that they remain. I mean, they, even now they remain obviously. Mm. Can you uh, speak a bit louder? Yeah, yeah. So, we have so, an audience. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Because you know the, the conversation was. So I'm what, what I'm trying to say is that obviously not. Other if, you know Indian language is, is a huge uh, you know. Scene. I think we so, have some uh, questions from the audience. Let us take them up. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Philip D'Souza, please uh, yes. go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Philip D'Souza. I'm joining you from University of Limerick. I'm pursuing my master's in dance performance contemporary. So uh, earlier in your conversation, you said that emotions create uh, body movements or dance movements, right? But what I am learning here in contemporary is just the reverse of that, that theory, that when you do a modern, postmodern dance, when you create shapes, it brews, it creates emotion in you. So is there any, this kind of concept is mentioned in uh, Natya Shastra? Well, sorry. Well, you know, uh, in, uh, what, if, I, if I've got you correctly, what, you, what you're trying to say, of course, is, this, then, is, is that uh, in the theatre tradition, the uh, contemporary postmodern theatre tradition, you're trying to say that the the physical postures, obviously the physical movements and the forms of physical movements create emotion. That's what you're trying to say? Yes, and most of the time, I'll speak for myself when I'm doing improvisation, when I'm, when I'm doing dance. It's just yeah. that most of the time, I always experience thai bhav, it's very calm and soothing. But as the movement goes, as we create shapes in our dance, I can sense that there's a shift of emotion as well. So, uh, well, is see, this yeah. in, in Nati Shastra? Well, you, you know, it's quite obvious. You know, uh, the first uh, uh, interpreter of Nati Shastra, uh, sorry, of the theory of Rasa, which is uh, Bhat Lolat, Bhat Lolat, if you read uh, Abhinav Gupta's uh, commentary of Nati Shastra, and it's English translation by Rainier Nolly. The first, uh, there's only there's only an extract uh, of um, this commentary uh, of Bhattalolats, obviously, that Abhinav Gupta recounts. There he talks about Anusandhan. So uh, what what he what he means there, and we can only see these classical texts are, uh, you know, is quite quite aph quite aphoristic, and we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, perhaps read them uh, in a different way to. Uh, know the, the 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 potential meanings that is emanating there. So what 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 Bhattalolat says is is this that an actor has uh, has a unique ability. And what is the unique ability of an actor? The unique ability of an actor is this that there are there there is a multiplicity in him and around him or her. Uh, you know, in form of different objects of perceptions, different objects of memory, different impressions in the mind, uh, you know, different objects, uh, you know, or different meanings to be enacted. And what an actor can do, which none of us can do, is this, that an actor has the ability, through the movement of his body, to turn these multiplicities into motion, into a certain unity. That's what I mean. But coming back to you, uh, the, the clue to, to what you said here is this that even when you are actually performing, and, and thank you for this question, this is a very important question for me, even I'm, as I'm thinking, as I'm replying to you, is this that, that an actor, uh, 
when an actor is actually, and there's a, there's a question that comes up actually uh, in the first chapter of Natasha itself and when Abhinav Gupta is responding, this is that, that does an actor actually feel the bhava uh, when he or she is performing, obviously? Uh, does he feel it or she feel it? A uh, straight answer to your question is this, that even while you are performing, in your act of performance, you're creating as well, you're creating as well. Because obviously an actor's memory is alive, an actor's perception is alive. So even when let's say you are, you are, on, you are in a performative uh, flow, there are new, uh, what you call emotions, uh, is what Bharata would exactly call the Sanchari Bhavas. So let's say if I have to perform a scene of Rati, of course, uh, you know, which is love, and uh, I need, uh, and I'm performing it, I'm performing, or let's say an actor is performing, let's say whether in a cityscape or a rural escape, and at a certain point of performance, one actually experiences agitation, aveg, agitation, that you may not, that may not be there, uh, you know, as to begin with an emotion in you, but your performance as such, the body movement as such, as you rightly said, that leads to this emotion. But I will not call it as a body movement producing emotion as such, or shaping or giving rise to this emotion. But I will call it a continuous actually flow or a configuration in an act of performance in which a new sthai bhava, sorry, a new vevichari bhava or transitory emotional state has taken form. That's what it is. That's what it is. So rather than calling it as an effect of a body movement, what I'll, I what I I'll, I'll say is 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 a different stage into this continuum of enactment <clears throat> that we're doing. That's what I'm. That's what, yes, I, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I uh, think it is Mitali Bhattacharya. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, good yeah, evening, go sir. Ahead. Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, so first of all, thank you so much for such an enlightening session. It has indeed, uh, you know, raised and cleared a lot of doubts in my mind regarding theater and how theater functions as a literary text also. And my question uh, is like, uh, sir, you have mentioned about in the starting about the concept of uh, ubiquitous performativity, which I found really interesting. So uh, how can we understand the concept of uh, ubiquitous performativity in the light of modern Indian theater? Like in classical uh, Indian theater in plays like uh, Ramayana and Mahabharat, uh, there are always archetypes of uh, good and evil. Most of the times we are always presented with these two themes and there's a juggling between, th between these two uh, themes most of the times. But uh, when it comes to modern Indian theater, uh, it is the plight of the modern man which is basically presented. So how can we understand ubiquitous perfort, 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 this, one, this concept in this uh, modern Indian theater? You see, I, I, I use that, uh, that phrase, of course, uh, you know, in a slightly different uh, you know, uh, way, in, in connotation, context, of course, which is just that, obviously, as you said, in modern Indian theater, uh, you know, the, the, the certainly significant themes are about uh, the plight of being a human and you know, uh, all that. Uh, and there itself, uh, you know, uh, performativity, uh, and that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about Bhartrahari, is in a different context. When I say that performativity uh, is uh, ubiquitous or, you know, performance is, 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 is ubiquitous, because Bhartrahari, and that's my uh, that's my interpretation of his reading. Of course, I have an unp unpublished paper on that. Uh, in in Vakipadim, of course, uh, you know Karika one. If you read translation Subramanim Bharati's, you know, uh, so, sorry Subramanim uh, translation, um, K Subramanim translation uh, of uh, of uh, Vakipadim. Uh, you know, Bhartrari, what he says is something uh, which is very profound uh, for for anyone who's interested in performances. Uh, I think, because what he, what he what he claims uh, you know, what he claims there with regard to language is this that there that there is always obviously, and that uh, we know later on in the West, of of course, people make a distinction between the between language and meaning. 
uh, in how there's a gap or what Vartarini says is this, that language uh, that we speak or language that we write uh, is never the language that we want to speak. Obviously, it doesn't say language that we write. Actually, he's making a distinction between uh, sphota and dhvani, to use his terms, basically. Sphota and dhvani, the mental world and the physical world, basically. So what is saying, the mental world, there's a word in the mind, obviously, and the world that I speak, uh, that I speak, obviously, the world that I perform. And the word that I perform, uh, because we all are speakers of language, uh, but we all are conscious of the limitation of human speech when we uh, when we speak because the the word that we have in mind is never the word that we speak what essentially he means is this what essentially he means is this that there is a that there is a chasm between between the ideal world ideal world that can that can communicate the meaning that we intend to communicate mm -hmm. and the word that we speak that a word that we speak, that word we can speak, the sound that we can produce. Since there is this gap always, always a gap, obviously, they, we are all the time in our consciousness trying to reach to that word, obviously. And since we are trying to reach to that word, what we are seeing is performing, obviously. Uh, we are performing all the time. This is what we mean, that this is what we mean by performing all the time in theater or outside theater for this day. Because, and that's why we are, we find the, 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 the language being not a necessity, but we are condemned to speak in a way, because mm. we can never reach the meaning that, uh, that we want to reach. I mean, that since I said, and obviously in modern theater as well, I mean, and I'm saying this not in terms of, uh, not as in terms of themes of, uh, you know, of, of performance, but generally, generally the very idea of performance, uh, you know, both uh, empirical, uh, both in the living living life, uh, you know, and in the theater life. That's what I yeah. think. Yeah. I think her question also mm -hmm. related to, maybe uh, you just uh, forgot uh, this, uh, mm -hmm. related to, you know, she was comparing uh, uh, the ancient tradition, for example, she talked about Ramayana and Mahabharat mm -hmm. with the modern, uh, say, from 19th century onward, the plays and how. And I think, you know, she made one point which I think, you know, uh, we will disagree with probably. Mm -hmm. I, I remember she said that, you know, uh, there the characters were black and white, more or less, good or no, bad. That, no, that obviously no. is not correct. I mean, in, even in the case of Ramayana, you know, uh, you, you take the case of, for example, the character of Wali. The character of Wali has all the subtleties. He is not all bad. When Ram uh, uh, kills uh, Wali from behind the tree, and you uh, read the, uh, their discourse, you see that there is a lot of subtlety, and Wali has been given his due by the poet. No, you see, all literature, whether, of course, modern literature. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I did not mean. Yeah, I did not mean that the characters are black and white. What I meant was that uh, there are certain, uh, you know specific themes that uh, that have been uh, portrayed in those plays but uh, as we come to modern indian theater uh, that concept of you know exact meaning or exact themes uh, you know they tend to uh, lose out their meanings like there is a, the there is a kind of a blurring in terms of themes yeah but that's a post modernist thing not no, modern. That's a, no, 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 but that's the important point she raised of course which is just that there are uh, Plural and shifting meanings, of course, in theater. That's what you mean. Yes, sir. You know, exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shifting, but, shifting of the paradigm, a paradigm shift in the meanings of uh, what we can, you know, infer from those themes, and not specifically see them as black and white or maybe good and evil. But there is the blurring of, of all those meanings. So yes, uh, yeah. so you are right that it's a more postmodernist take. But uh, when we talk about the model plight of the modern man, that is what the modern modern man is basically dealing with. There is a constant, uh, you know, stretch or a constant uh, tension between what we should do or what we shouldn't do. So that's all right. What Very I, good. Yeah. Let's take the last question of today. Thank Shraddha, you, sir. Shraddha Thank you so much, Shraddha Singh. Please go sir. ahead. Be, please be brief. We are now, we have reached the end of this session. Yeah. Yes, Hello, please am I go ahead. Sir? 
yes sir good uh, good evening sir sir my question is related to the satvik bhav that you discussed towards the end and uh, like uh, uh, we have seen examples of angik and uh, uh, vachik as well but so far as this satvik bhav is concerned so uh, can you tell us one example where uh, we see the emotion being communicated without using vak or uh, ang You see, all these four aspects of abhinay are all integrated, as you say, as you as uh, I said uh, earlier, and uh, <clears throat> even vachik for vachik abhinay also music is important, right? Because music comes in as a support for vachik abhinay. Because just now, as I said, it's impossible for speech to uh, to actually make uh, uh, the entire meaning to communicate the entire meaning, and therefore we need the uh, we need the support of music to raise this consciousness. Coming to sattvic. Sattvic bhava, of course, Bharat, you know, gives all those eight, you know, sattvic bhava and corresponding sattvic abhinay, of course, you know, corporation, perspiration, and all that that he talks about, uh, you know, as uh, sattvic bhava. The example, you know, uh, sattvic abhinay, uh, they they won't be textual example, obviously, unless they, unless they, these are all very dull description that a particular character, obviously. uh you know uh, undergoes uh, you know for instance a lear if you if you if you stood the student of english literature of course lear in the storm scene you know you have a lot of uh, possible potential of representation of uh, satvik bhav there um, and it 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 comes to uh, as i said it comes to certain proficiency in, in acting but basically satvik bhav means this that is it possible to communicate the motion of the mind that's the meaning that's it uh motion of the mind that's how, that's how i read it basically and uh, you know i have my book coming next next i mean i should be talking about my book of course which is this that this all comes in that you know, comes in, in that book obviously which i i i interpret it it in this way that how can um, the how can a motion of the mind be communicated the motion of the mind uh percolates on the face without any exertion of the will you know that's what is satvik uh that's what the satvik uh bhava and its satvik abhinay and uh, uh in uh, more more often than not actually satvik abhinay uh, is in the domain of the actor uh an actor who because satvik abhinay uh the involuntary uh, satvik bhava the involuntary states basically is to be recognized by the by the actor um you know and its abhinay or and its enactment is is the support in the sense of in the sense of the agni and angik or vachik abhinay uh and the actor makes possible makes possible <coughs> sometimes you see in you know, if you're interested in if you're interested in the bollywood and uh, you know then some actors people say for instance that fan khan he had that ability of course that you can directly see the transference from the mind to his face without he actually exerting anything uh, that is possible where, where the motion of the mind is visible on the face without the face changing itself that is possible that's what is satvik abhinay uh, that's what it is all right uh okay, i think with that we have i think with that we have with that no no uh, i think no, no. we have absolutely I run out of time i'm very sorry about that i'm very sorry about that sir it's a very short who is it sir it's yashika yeah please sir. go ahead please be very brief and i will request yes, uh, professor dhananjay uh, singh also to be brief yeah okay. go ahead yes sir so uh, as we were talking about vritti as the intrinsic inhi ka to question hai bhai aap mukh kar rahe hain mute mat kariye yashika yashika ye jinko abhi aapne mute kiya yashika please go ahead aapne mute kar diya aapne mute kar diya ha sir can you hear yeah, me please go ahead yeah, please go ahead Yes, sir. As we talk, as we were talking about vritti as the intrinsic human desire to communicate, and as we talk about communication in the field of theatre and performative, uh, performative studies. So, uh, I'm I'm doing my dissertation on phenomenology of theatre and the interaction between audience and the actor. So, uh, what is your take uh, as a Natya Shastra's perspective on this communication? 
Communication between the audience. Can you please repeat it? No, no, communication. No, no, I just couldn't hear it. I was singing something. Yes, you can speak. Yes, you can. Can you repeat your question? Yeah, please go ahead. So basically, the interaction between audience and the uh, actor. So mm -hmm. I am writing about it as a phenomenological aspect where the self and the other is involved. Mm -hmm. So what is Natya Shastra's take on that relation and interaction? But there is certainly an interaction. Uh, you should, if you're interested, of course, uh, then you should read uh, the commentator uh, whose name is Sri Shankuka of Natishastra, Sri Shankuka, uh, where, of course, this idea of, um, of Sai Bhava, uh, let's say, in a play of uh, in, uh, representing love or, let's say, Shoka, uh, and its representation on stage, this Thai Bhava is mental, right? Is mental, psychological, emotive. It gets manifested through the body movements, you know that. What you see on stage is perception of body movements, music, speech, and all that. And there is an Asthai Bhava that is directing all this. Now, the audience, of course, the audience is not uh, passive. The Indian, the term for audience is Prekshaka, which is, of course, the one who sees, but also Adhikari, Adhikari, or Saherdaya. Now, Adhikari means that the meaning of drama or theater, sorry, is completely, uh, you know, uh, the, the domain of the, of the spectator. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, to cut it short, what, uh, what is basically presented is this the actor, uh, the, the actor, the writer, uh, the spectator, uh, uh, you know, the, the writer, the actor, the spectator, uh, you know, all three, in fact, interact, interact uh, in the final, uh, you know, manifestation of Rasa through Abhine. And therefore, the actor, uh, sorry, the spectator is all the time constructing the meaning, constructing the meaning of the play in performance. And to, to, to actually explain this, to take one minute, to explain this, uh, this particular commentator, he uses the Nyaya theory, uh, of perception, of perception, inference, and testimony uh, to argue uh, that obviously uh, that the spectators in the audience, it's not a detailed exposition, but it's, it's as I said, it's quite brief, but there's a lot of possibilities of interpretation, which is this, that the actors make a contribution in the sense that they are inferring meaning. They're inferring meaning. They see something. Uh, they, they're perceiving a particular image on stage and they're inferring meaning. And since they are, since inference, uh, you know, admits, uh, you know, active participation, obviously, uh, you know, of the subject. And therefore, there is a constant activity going on in self and the other on the stage. There certainly is. It's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. Ah, I think with that, we reach the end of uh, today's lecture and discussion. Uh, once again, I thank all members of the audience and I thank Professor Dhananja Singh for thank accepting you. our invitation and uh, coming here. And uh, as I said, it has been a very, very illuminating uh, lecture and we have had a very interesting uh, discussion as well. Once again, I thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah.